Hey, fitness and health fans, Coach Frank here. Today, I'm going to bring you a special guest who is a real life Cobra Kai fighter. Cobra Kai has been very popular the last few years. It's something I've been really involved with, and I've always wanted to have a martial arts instructor come on here. I got one today. So get in the game because I'm going to bring you all that and more right after this. Let's do this. Game on, sports, fitness, and health fans, with another episode of the Sporting Good Posture Digital Radio Experience. Gear up for Coach Frank's advice from the sidelines as he helps you crush your game. No matter what sports, health, or fitness game you play. Hey, this is Coach Frank. I'm Sporting Good Posture. What are you sporting? Hey, Coach, what do you got for us today? Welcome back to another episode of Sporting Good Posture. This is Coach Frank here. And today I have a special guest, Eric Melton. I'm going to be interviewing him about his life and his experiences in martial arts. And we're going to get to that and more right after this. Where do you carry your stress? Whether you carry it in your shoulders, hold it in your neck, or feel it in your back, it's usually not chronic, but it's always annoying. Carrying stress isn't normal at all, but how can you know for sure how the stress you carry can be hindering you? The answer is the Advanced Postural Impact Screening at Ideal Health and Wellness Center. Chiropractic studies have revealed that posture is more than just how straight you stand. It measures spinal and skeletal support of every body function. Poor posture reveals trouble areas in your basic structure, interfering with body function, leading to pain, discomfort, tension, sleep trouble, and even digestive issues and allergies. There isn't a body function that isn't potentially at risk. Dr. Margella conducts the advanced postural impact screening to trace back postural issues to their origins, which often have been accumulating over your entire life to find the real reasons things haven't been working their best. And that means everything when you're trying to reach your ideal performance. See where the sources of the stress you carry lie and find out what you yourself can do about them. Call Ideal Health and Wellness Center at 6 615-567-6683 now. Today I'm going to bring you a special guest who is a real life Cobra Kai. As you know, that's one of my favorite shows. I've, I've loved martial arts for a long time. And I have somebody today that's actually a martial arts expert. His name is Eric Melton. He's a former world welterweight kickboxing champion, US light and middleweight kickboxing champion. He's a black belt in Pilum Kung Fu black belt in Shotokan karate. He's author of his first autobiography and book, My Fight with God, and teaches Taekwondo as ministry with biblical applications, and is very involved with the community in teaching Sunday school, and has gone on many mission trips and speaks worldwide. I want to introduce you today to Eric Melton. Eric, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you have an amazing story, and I got to meet you a couple weeks ago, and we talked a little bit about what got you into martial arts in the first place many years ago? And then kind of how has it shaped you to now how you teach martial arts at Impact where you're at now? I was around 15 years old and um, I was in trouble all the time. What got me into martial arts is a policeman. who um, He saw something else in me that uh, I didn't see in myself. My mother got sick when I was 12 and she was sick until I was 15. She passed. And after she passed, I'd been in lots of trouble. Everybody in my group we called us a group, not a gang. He either went to jail, died, or went to prison. I was uh, raised military, so I was always saying yes sir, no sir is part of my, I guess who I was. But I was I was part of the group. I was just as bad as everybody else. And um, I was picked up by the police, and I was given an ultimatum, either go to a martial art class. I was definitely headed to jail. But the uh, police officer that got me, he gave me the opportunity to come to his house and he would teach me martial arts with another group. And so of course I went there and I didn't want to go there. I hate every minute of being there, (laughs) but it was five miles from my house. I couldn't get a ride. Uh, Part of the stipulation was I can't get a ride. I have to go there. I spend two hours there and I have to run back, run there and back. And so uh, every Monday night I would do this. And like I said, every moment there, I hated it. Gotten lots of fights there. And uh, so (laughs) That was uh, either that or go to jail, and I, I chose that. And then year after year went by. It took me seven years to get my first black belt. So a lot of it was because every time I'd get right to black belt, I'd get demoted all the way back to yellow belt because of my attitude. And uh, eventually I made it, and uh, that's what started me on martial arts. When was that? Was that in? Uh, 75, so I was 15. I just turned 15. Mom died uh, right before all that. And, um Dad was uh, worked, worked on the Army base, and uh, he was gone all the time, and just sort of there's five of us kids. And I was right smack in the middle, and uh, 
I was the smaller one of all of us. All my brothers are six four or better. My sister's five ten, and I'm I was barely five seven for the most part. I did grow a little bit after high school, but not much. But um, this is the way I made my way. You know, you got a lot of muscle on you, and and you're still in great shape. So. Whatever you lacked in, in size, you, you made up in strength and and, uh, and fortitude. So it, I wasn't great smart in school, but I was smart when it came to fighting. Only because you just sort of have to find your way. My way was uh, I used a clarinet on the bus one day. The guy picked on me for two years. Uh, my last thing my mom said was she wanted me to play in the band. My biggest brother was an all-star football player. My other brother was an all-star basketball player, and she wants me to play in the band. <laughs> and I said, the only thing I, I could get, the school gave me a clarinet. It was about this long, about this thick. It had a handle on the end. And I'm driving, riding home on the school bus, and this guy kept picking on me, same guy for two years. And I thought about it for a second. I got the handle, and I took care of business. <laughs> and uh, the school bus lady, Miss Hester, stopped the bus, walked back, and she said, it's about time. Went back to sit down and drove us on the way home. Never had a problem with this guy again. <laughs> I know my dad grew up in Brooklyn, told me that's how a lot of things he he handled things back then, too. And a lot of times you end up being friends with these people afterwards, too. Oh, we did. We did. We did become friends. So you told me you were just you were hungry. You were trying to gain knowledge and, and experience in there. And you told me that you would just fight basically anybody at any time just just to gain experience. And and uh, tell me a little bit about that again. We uh the way I got to Nashville from Clarksville was a police officer drove me out to exit 11. I, I honest to God thought at my time, this is my end. And he said, you need to get out of town that you just made too many people upset. And so I didn't have any gas and having, I had nothing. So he gives me, he gives me a tank of gas on his credit card, gives me all the cash in his pocket. I don't remember where I was, but it's like seven, eight bucks. And I drove to Nashville. He told me where to go. And I went to Nashville, and I, was, I used to, over on Charlotte Avenue, I used to drive in. The, there's an apartment complex and back in my car. If you back in your car, it always looks like it doesn't look odd, you know, for people yeah. to pass by you. So I sleep in my car. And uh, I got a – there's a place that was called um, Ringside Seat, restaurant with a boxing ring. They would pay $20. Uh, I don't know if it's open to everybody, but they gave it me the 20 bucks a fight. I'd fight three or four times a night. I'd box, I'd kick box, I'd, I'd do whatever the person wanted to do. And uh, that was the way, in my mind, I was getting better. I'll, I was at a boxing gym at the time over on 12th Avenue. It was an old firehouse. This is where I got my experience. I would fight sometimes three, four times a night. And, uh, you know, 60 bucks to me was... You're earning that money, too. I mean, that wasn't yeah. easy money <laughs> with what you had to do for it. So like as you headed into the 80s and everything, when you were training more, how did that morph into you getting more involved with kickboxing and really climbing the ladder to being a, a world champion at that point? Honestly, I never thought about being a world champion. My idea was putting food on the table, paying rent, paying whatever bills I had. That just came with it. I went to a gym and I fought in the uh, South a lot. But I just just getting better and better. And then I went to another gym that chose me to come. They came to me and said, hey, we need a fighter in the gym. And I knew the gym was a big time gym. So I went there and uh, all they needed was for me to be a fighter for all the rest of good fighters. I was the one they're going to knock around <laughs> to be for the good fighters. And that's, a, you know, that was a big step for me. You know, I said, sir, I would get knocked out, I don't know, three, four times a week and uh, by the good fighters. I have to fight two rounds is all I was assigned to fight. And then I could come to that gym. So I would sit there and watch them and watch them, watch them and uh, spend all my time just watching the other fighters. I get in the ring, I get jacked, I come out, somebody else goes <laughs> in. And so uh, there was a day like a year later, I mean, it took a whole year. Uh, I make it to the fourth round. I'm actually going further. And then, and then further. And then, then I finally made it to nine rounds. And then they started saying, okay, you, We'll set you up with some fights. And so I, I went that way. I boxed for a while. And, but I was a better martial artist than a boxer. I started late boxing. So the kickboxing came in right there. You know, I would uh, have a manager out of uh, Orlando, Florida. He would set the fights up. I would go fight. And then I finally got my first international fight in Europe. And then when I won, everybody wants to beat you then. So I got a lot of fights overseas. And that really helped me a lot. Then the titles. It was like... Uh, the first title was, uh, I got a U.S. title. 
lightweight title. Then I got a, I went over to Europe and I knocked out the middleweight champion. So it just went from there. And the first middleweight champion in Europe was just a fight, but it set me up for everything else. That led into you going into like a world fight where you were able to yeah. go. I did. I, my first real world title fight was in Texas. And uh, the guy was great. I lost my first two or three fights, but I won everything after that. Not, I never even got knocked down. And uh, oh, man, so awesome. I go down to Albuquerque and go and I fight this guy. And uh, his own words, he said, I've never been hit so hard in my life. But uh, I ducked. I watched the fight sometimes. I didn't even dream about it still. And it's 40 years ago. So I ducked down below his waist and his knee came up and knocked me cold. So I woke up in the dressing room going, and I'm thinking it, I haven't even fought yet. And so uh, <laughs> but that, that was my first one. And then after that, I got hungry for it. I wasn't real hungry at the time. I'm just getting to be on big time TV and making a little bit of money. And after that, I kind of got hungry for it. Okay, I know what I'm doing. So I fought the, the guy for the title. And first round, he knocked me down. Now, this is from a guy who hasn't been knocked down very much. And so I went through uh, 12 rounds with him. He broke my yeah. jaw, my nose, my eardrum my eye orbit, both hands, all before the fifth round. And I know I'm in trouble. And I didn't really say anything for it. When I was 12 and mom died, God really came into my heart. But I really didn't have time. But in that fight, on the fifth round, I'm sitting there on the stool, and I know it's over. I can't even see, much less breathe. And the guy looking across at the guy, and he's just, he just getting going. And uh, all I asked the guy to do was, I just want to stand at the end. Just that. I don't have to win. So I went out there and I just took it, took it, took it, threw it back. And then he opened his arm and I caught him in the elbow with a round kick and popped it. And uh, I knew right then that I'd hurt this man. And uh, he didn't know. He, we even talked about this. He had no idea he broke my jaw, my cheek, my nose. It's one of the things that we did in our gym is learning how to just deal with the pain. You know, uh, there's no <laughs> saying, lawyers, we have to feel our pain. And when you feel it, you can deal with it. It's when you hide it. It's when the problems. Yeah, so we got yeah. into the 12th round. And I dropped him a few times. He dropped me a few times and um, had him up against the ropes and dropped him. And 12 seconds left to go. I looked over at the referee and I, I said, I, I think he's done. And he goes, yeah, it looks that way. Call the fight. Wow. I held the title 11 weeks. But when he broke my jaw, I went through my eardrum yeah. and up into my head. I knew two days later I'd never fight again. So I just held on to it for a while just to say I had it. Yeah. I had to give it up. That reminds me of like Rocky too, when they go the distance and they both go down at the end of the, of the match and Rocky somehow stands up at the end. So that's impressive to take a beating like that and still be standing there at the end. That, and that's what most people say. When they see that, it's on YouTube somewhere. Most people say, uh, they don't say what a great fighter you are. And then they always say, man, you can take a beating. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've left to the world. Is that when you started teaching or is that when you started, were you still sparring and everything then? I, I sparred a couple of times, um, not very much because I, I couldn't risk being hit. The people yeah. that wanted to spar me were always really good. And so uh, I started teaching at churches for free because I knew that my personality coming out of being a fighter and coming out of the world I grew up in wasn't conducive to teaching kids. Yeah. This uh, was too hard, way too hard. I mean, it's like um, I tease all the time now. If you was to open up a child now, they'd have bubble wrap all in them, you know? So uh, <laughs> back then, you know, my first instructor was a cop. You, you just didn't mess with him. I mean, he was a bad, bad dude. And as, <laughs> but he taught us how to take care of ourselves. And eventually, I, ta- I had a hard time with him the first couple of years. But uh, he was right. He was right about just about everything, you know, how to take care of yourself, leave people alone, do what's necessary. You know, same thing I teach my kids now, my martial arts kids. And there's nothing wrong with this. If you want to do the tournament route, fine. It's just not for me. I teach kids how to take care of themselves. And the problem with the tournaments for me doesn't mean it's for everybody else. Is once you get 18 or 19, you go on to work and, you know, you have nothing left. Uh, tournament fighting, like point fighting is, um, and I'll get a lot of flack for this, point fighting is more of a scoring points as a sport. And it's yeah. a good thing. I mean, you win trophies and yay. And for me, I want you to take care of yourself. Know what to do, when to do it. 
And that's what I believe a black belt is, someone who knows what to do and when to do it, not someone that can kick real pretty. Uh, you need to do your drills. You need to do your punches and kicks, and there's that's push-ups and sit-ups. But if you do enough, you'll be fine, but you have to know what to do and when to do it. It's like uh, I got in a lot of fights. I mean, I'm talking three, four hundred, and I didn't win them all, you know, but I learned a lot. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, when there's three guys, what to do, who's going to take you first, what to watch out for, uh, stuff like that. You know, it's not a movie. What I wanted to go in next was then, so you ended up carrying the torch for the Olympics through Franklin, Tennessee, and bring me through how that happened. Like who who asked you and how did you get picked? and just kind of tell me about how that was. I was teaching at these uh, churches and stuff, and um, I was asked to go to a place called Zone 18 in uh, Guatemala. So it wasn't Guatemala like you send doctors and stuff to. This is a little bit of a war zone. There's several gangs there. In Zone 18, there's two gangs. Uh, I got there, and there's um, one gang on the, on the basketball court and another gang on the other side of the basketball court, and a bunch of girls hanging out, maybe 16 or 17. My job was to teach them self-defense. So after the first day of trying to teach these kids self-defense in three different groups, uh, I realized that um, these guys don't need self-defense. They need, this is going to sound terrible. These guys need to know how to stay alive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's no self-defense here. If you whooped them all, there's nowhere to go. I mean, you, you can go from one house to another. Most of these kids are uh, orphans and they're not children like you think. I mean, they, they just need to stay alive. So I went there and my wife wrote this thing to the Olympic Committee and told them about what I encountered there and uh, how I helped and um, just stuff like that. I think all of it together and being a world champion and trying to teach kids and churches how to take care of themselves. And um, I think all of that together uh, helped me come to run the Olympic torch. What pathway did they take? Uh, or- Franklin Road Academy is where I started and uh after I got through fighting, I fought in Switzerland and Russia and Canada and all over Europe and America and South America. It wasn't that big a deal to me. Uh, they do the the screens and the FBI screens and uh, a lot of press, Channel 4, and I did a lot of Channel 2. But um, it wasn't a big deal to me. And I'm standing on the side of the road from Franklin Road Academy, and uh, they bring hand me the torch, and there's a guy standing with me, gives me my instructions, and, and I'm I'm looking to the right. And my wife and I had two kids, and she's pregnant, standing down on the road waiting for me, and so it was it was I don't know if I can explain it in the words. When the guy pointed at the torch, it was to my back. I turned around, and it was like the world just opened up. I mean, look, you can't see here now, but I get goosebumps. I have goosebumps now after all these thousands of years of just being, wow. And this is the same person I didn't think it would be a big deal. Thank yeah, I get to do the torch. But I'm just like, wow. And I can't move. The guy says, you got to run. They like the torch, and I'm just standing there. I'm just, <laughs> and uh, I turn around. The guy, we'd already get on how fast we're going to run and stuff like that. And if um, I trip or fall, to hand it to him we can't touch the ground and so i'm just standing there he goes you you gotta you gotta run i said what and i'm just like okay yeah i start running and i'm just sprinting he goes slow it down slow it down so uh he goes this happens to lots of people i can't explain how when i turn around all i could think was wow it's like walking into a dark room and telling somebody turning the lights on it's like wow and that's what it meant. And at, at first, I mean, I was a no big deal, but then it was it was a big, big deal. I can't even imagine how special that would feel and just the emotions that you must feel representing our country. Even, even, even now, after all these years, I still get good fun. I love the Olympics. I love what it means. I love when you see them on the podium and they play the national anthem and and I mean, running with the torch, you see that. Like, I, I remember watching uh, Muhammad Ali light the torch years ago. And I think that was actually, was that the same one? I, I remember seeing it. I was I was a kid at that point. I was 13 or 14. And I remember watching that and thinking how cool that was. And just knowing that the Olympics were in the U.S. and Atlanta. And at your gym there, you have the torch, you have some memorabilia of you of when you fought and everything. We took some pictures there. That's really cool to see everything that you that you were able to save and, and have it in that, that casing up front. 
uh, right when you come in the gym. I was very impressed when I walked in. I saw that. When did you write the book, My Fight with God? It's about early 2000. I sat down one day and I said, I want to write all the stories down in my head, all the fights and how we organized them. And we were organized. Well, we were a, we were a tough group of kids and we were all lost. You know, even I told you, I found God when I was 12, but I had no relationship with Christ. And so over the years, like when we would, take things that didn't belong to us, I would never, <laughs> this is the way a 12 year old thinks. Okay. I truly found God. I really felt him in my heart. He really, I really gave myself to God. But like I said, back then we lived in a real rough area. Coming to our house was not a good thing for people who want to help you with Christ. It was just, they got me saved. I got saved and I went on my way. But over the years, God never left me. Okay. I left him from time to time, but, uh, the way I did things was if we took things that didn't belong to us, I would not take any money for it. Not, not the, not the first penny never did take the first penny because in my faith as a 12 year old and 13, 14 after that was, if I don't take any money for this, I'm going to say I really didn't do it, but that's crazy. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like, uh, well, that, that's how it worked for me and just uh, trying to make it from day to day. And then you started, teaching at impact or in the early 2000s or mid 2000s was it i did and the book thing was i i didn't want to forget the stories because i i tell stories to the kids all the time the other day i told a whole 50 kids i got bit by a shark and it was three foot tall and it's a white shark and by the end of the story he traveled 100 yards with me on his back and it was a lemon shark i don't even know if there's such a thing as a lemon shark but just making up stories over the years I wanted to make sure that these stories never changed, that they were what they were. And I did what I did. I don't ever claim to be the nice guy, but, uh, but uh, that's what I wrote. And each story at the end of the stories, it's like, um, you know, where, where were you God with during all this? You know, uh, why are you letting this happen? Just trying to find my way through it, you know, with a little sanity about it. I think you did. I think doing that is really impactful on not only the kids, but anybody that reads that book and anybody that comes to the gym there and meets with you. And I know not only the martial arts that you do over there, but you also do those Nerf gun wars over there that everybody loves to have you showing them how to do that. Tell me a little bit about the gym besides the martial arts. You do the Nerf gun wars, you do camps there. And what else do you guys do there? Well, we have gymnastics. We have tricking, something uh, which I cannot do. Um, when, you jump, when you jump up and down in air and spin six different directions, I can't fall. I can't fall backwards. I've tried, and um, we do a lot of that. And we do. We have some really great coaches, like you said, the Nerf Wars. That's really fun. We do that every two weeks, and and it's great because you can do it with your kids. I, I was watching some uh, dad the other day. My dad was military, so we uh, we played baseball one time because he's always gone. That yeah. I, I still remember. I'm 61 this Thursday. And I remember that just like yesterday and all these dads who come make memories with their kids. And it's always fun to get to shoot the little guys. They, they, they don't turn left real well, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's fun. You know, you, I make them say yes, sir. No, sir. I make them uh, build strategies and uh, all over the gym, but we, we do stuff like that. And, and of course the classes, my class is not for everybody. I, t- I tell everybody who comes in, I want you to do martial arts, but I might not be the teacher for you because we don't do tournaments. We uh, do a lot of strategy thinking all the time. It's like when it's, but it's age appropriate. You know, um, if you're a, I teach a fight class where I actually teach people how to fight, uh, but nobody's fighting each other. I mean, it's, it's not a boxing class, although we, I believe in boxing It's a great strategy, uh, but I teach boxing and I teach how to, to think through a situation before the situation happens. And the best way to do that is, um, I, I've done it. You know, I've been the good and I've been the bad. And I can tell you what, I'm, both of them are thinking. And uh, we got a letter the other day, I say the other day, it was a year ago, about a lady being attacked. I mean, physically attacked. I taught so many people, I don't remember her, but I got tagged in her email and uh, Facebook and she was physically laid hands on by a person. And she turned around and she goes, trained by Eric Melton. I put my hands up and started punching straight because people don't punch straight unless you're trained. And uh, 
busted him up. The guy left and she's, you know, she's all right. And uh, just that, you know, just try not to, I don't believe you should run. I trained at the prison for two years, almost two years. Uh, at my coach was a lieutenant there. So he let me in there. So I fought inmates for two years, every kind of person that you can imagine. And what I found out was majority of them could not fight. They were there and they did the things they did, but they couldn't physically fight. So if you turn and put up a good fight, your chances are not so bad. And, uh, so that's what I try to teach all the people. Nobody wants anybody to fight, but yeah. it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. It's going to happen. If you know what to do, it ends real fast. It's great that you're doing that for, for kids and, and women and just teaching them to be able to defend themselves because a lot of times you hear these horrible stories and you know, thank God you were there to show her that so she knew what to do in, in a situation like that. You know, the best thing that I've ever learned was I was in Clearview Baptist Church in the basement teaching a bunch of kids. Just got through my fighting career, and I was uh, I was barking orders at these children because I told them, I said, they were talking during class, and I said, uh, you guys are talking during class, and, and I'm a world champion. I have truly fought all over the world. This is how arrogant I sounded. <laughs> all over the world. And I said, you should just stand at attention, and I'm going to just fill your heads with all this information. And this little girl raised her hand in front of mine. And I cannot imagine what she was going through her head. She raised her hand and said, uh, what's a world champion? And I just, just um, <laughs> and changed my whole way of teaching. She didn't understand at that point what that really meant. Oh, I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so how can people get in touch with you and where is impact located we're at 121 Seaboard Lane, the old YMCA, right beside UPS. and uh, Right down by Costco there. Yeah, it's right there at Costco's. Cool Springs. How can people find out about you on social media? Impact Martial Arts and Gymnastics. We spell Impact, M-P-A-C-T. Facebook, uh, Instagram, Impact Sports can get you to either one of those. Well, Eric, I really appreciate you being on today, taking the time today to do this. And I think what you're doing is amazing. You have a great impact on the community and these kids and just teaching self-defense, I think is a lost art for, for most of the people around here. They just don't, they don't think about how important it is to know how to do those things. So I think everything you're doing is really impactful in the community. And I, I want to thank you for, for doing that. And thank you for being a guest today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Eric. I look forward to talking to you again soon, and, and I'll, I'll be stopping by the gym more often lately. So I highly recommend Eric and Impact Sports. It's a great gymnasium. They have gymnastics, camps, birthday parties for kids. I've also interviewed a couple of their gymnastics instructors in Avery and Savannah. So it's right by my office. It's a great place to be. I definitely recommend checking it out if you're interested in martial arts or just having fun in camps during the summer. And if you have any questions for me, or if you want to find out how far you are from nature's athletic blueprint for your body, I'm always happy to get them answered and help you sport good posture any way I can. And I wouldn't think of charging you for these recommendations, even if I have to comp you a little bit of my time in person in the process. You can follow me and DM me on Instagram at Sporting Good Posture or PM me on Facebook at Ideal Health and Wellness Center. Tell me what's going on and I'll tell you what I think. Remember... The Sensei's Dojo is always open. This is Sensei Frank. I'm Sporting Good Posture. How about you? The Sporting Good Posture Podcast is a broadcast wellness production powered by Ideal Health Wellness Center. All content copyright 2021. All rights reserved. Executive producer, Frank Sardella. Coach Frank appears courtesy of Ideal Health Wellness Center in Franklin. For more information, visit SportingGoodPosture.com and follow Coach on Instagram at Sporting Good Posture. That's awesome. <laughs> Insert Cobra Kai reference here. A sweep the leg or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's my boy, Crease. It's like a combination of Crease and Rocky yeah. in real life. <laughs> the student has become the teacher.